Hello, and welcome to Beyond Japan, an interdisciplinary podcast that looks at the broad reach of Japanese studies from within and beyond Japan. This podcast is brought to you by the Center for Japanese Studies at the Sensory Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures, in collaboration with the University of East Anglia. I'm your host, Oliver Moxon, Research Project, Research Project Coordinator at the Sainsbury Institute and Researcher of Language and Japanese War Heritage. This week we are joined by Dr. Koto Sadamura, Robert and Lisa Sainsbury Research Fellow at the Sainsbury Institute to discuss the place of humour in art through the works of the eccentric 19th century painter Kawanabe Kyosai. Kyosai's specialty of kyoga, or comic pictures, have historically been overlooked when compared with his more traditional works, despite being of equal skill and cultural significance. Kotler also unpicks how comic devices such as inversion of legendary figures were used to depict humorous situations which people of all classes could relate to, much like the memes of today. We hope you enjoy the show. Okay, good morning Koto. welcome to the podcast. Hi Oli, thank you for having me. So first off, we'd like to know a bit more about you. Can you tell us about your area of expertise and how your interests have brought you there? Yes, uh, so I'm an art historian specializing in late 19th century Japanese art. My particular focus is the Japanese painter Kawanabe Kyosai, who was active from the mid 1850s to the end of the 1880s. I was first drawn to this artist as a potential research subject through my interest in artistic interactions between Japan and the West in the late 19th century. When we think of this theme of um, Japan and the West and artistic influences in the late 19th century, one of the obvious research topics is Japanism or Japanism which is the fascination with Japanese arts and culture and their impact on Western art. Hokusai is a famous example, and people in Europe and in the US talked and wrote a lot about him, and they were inspired by Hokusai's art to create crafts and furniture designs, graphics and paintings and so on. But um, Japanese is not so much about interactions. It is more about the Western art than Japanese art and about what European and American artists were looking for as new inspirations. I was more interested in how this interest from outside impacted Japan and its artists, their view of Japanese art and its place in the world. Hokusai, for example, was already dead by the time of Japanese and he could not respond to what was happening in Europe or in the US. But Kyosai, he lived in the middle of all this and was able to respond, sometimes in person, in conversation with visitors from abroad, and of course with an interpreter as he only spoke Japanese. And there are a number of interesting accounts by Europeans who visited Kyosai in Tokyo such as the French industrialist Emile Guimet, the French artist Félix Regamé, the Australia-born British artist Mortimer Memphis, and also those who lived in Tokyo, like the German physician Elvin von Belt, the Anglo-Irish journalist Francis Brinkley, and the British architect Josiah Condor. In fact, these two studied Japanese painting with Kyosai. That's how Kyosai became my master's and then my PhD research topic, and now he is likely to be my life work subject. I see. So introduce us to Kainaba Kyosai, the eccentric artist who lived through the tumultuous end of the Tokugawa shogunate in the mid-19th century. What was his training as an artist and what set him aside from the other contemporary painters of the time? Kyosai was born in 1831. He grew up and lived in the shogun's capital of Edo. As an artist, he had such a vast range and worked in many different styles. He was primarily a painter, but he also designed woodblock prints and illustrated books. His works include serious religious images of Buddhist deities and Taoist sages, historical and legendary figures from Japan and China, happy and auspicious lucky gods, beautiful natural world, endearing and sometimes very wild animals, dreadful ghosts, comical monsters, 
funny satirical pictures depicting contemporary society and also uh, silly and outrageous sex images called shunga. <laughs> it's more difficult to think of subjects Kyosai did not depict. Stylistically, he was skilled in a variety of ink techniques from dynamic and powerful to subtle and elegant and also proficient in densely pigmented, gorgeously colored, detailed paintings. Kyosai was also well known for his speedy, spontaneous paintings in lighter and more fluid brush strokes. His impromptu performances attracted a lot of audience and he really was the star of the party. Kyosai excelled in all of these in diverse styles, dealing with varieties of subject matters. It's a pity I cannot show images to prove my points, but really, believe me, he's really, really good with the exceptional draftsmanship and masterful brushwork. Yeah, we'll have links to those uh, images in the uh, description afterwards, so people can follow up uh, once they've finished the episode. Cool, thank you. Kyosai's versatility certainly makes him stand out among his contemporaries. And as you've correctly suggested in your question, Oli, it's definitely related to his mixed training background. As a child from the age of eight to 10, Kyosai had his first drawing lessons with Utagawa Kuniyoshi, one of the most popular ukiyo-e artists of the day. After a few years of training with Kuniyoshi, Kyosai's parents decided to move him to a different atelier to study with Kano School Painter. The Kano School is a large institution with many branches, but it was basically the official school of painters who worked for the Tokugawa government and the ruling samurai class. Because Kyosai's parents had a samurai class status, lower ranking, but nevertheless, um, they probably thought it was more appropriate for their son to be affiliated with the Kano school rather than pursuing ukiyo-e, an art form associated with the townspeople's class. So from around the age of 10, Kyosai had a formal training at a Kano school, learning Chinese and Japanese classics, legendary figures, Taoist and Buddhist themes, various ausp auspicious subjects, and so forth. He finished the Kano curriculum in nine years and graduated in 1849 when he was 18 years old. By this time, the Tokugawa government's power was in decline and it was a difficult time for a young Kano painter to launch his career or even to make ends meet. So Kyosai in the mid 1850s made a life changing decision. He decided to work in the world of ukiyo-e woodblock prints, just like his old teacher Kuniyoshi. And not only that, he started to design comic and satirical prints. Just a decade earlier, it would have been unthinkable for an official Kano artist to produce a social satire. But by the 1850s, when the shogunate was losing its power and influence, social rules were becoming less strictly observed. Sorry, Koto, can I just ask for a clarification, who would a Kano artist normally be painting for as opposed to a ukiyo-e artist? So the Kano painters would um, work for the samurai class and um, the top branch of the school, they work for the government directly. And the uh, ukiyo-e painters would be more for common consumption, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, in the 1860s, during this last phase of Tokugawa regime, Kyosai produced numerous satirical prints dealing with the political conflicts and battles, which led to the Meiji Restoration in 1868. It is important to remember that he continued to produce Kano-style paintings, and we also know that Kyosai voraciously self-studied works of ancient masters from different schools, as well as certain Western techniques such as perspective and shading. This hybrid ukiyo-e Kano career makes Kyosai unusual as an artist of the Tokugawa period, 
But what makes him unique is the eclectic style Kyosai established by fusing two pictorial modes, which he learned from these two different worlds. I'm going to go into terminology, but please bear with me. The pictorial mode associated with the Kano tradition is what we call honga, which means formal, orthodox, or proper painting. Honga are paintings made after preparatory drawings, not necessarily, but often with a lot of colors and minute details. They normally deal with serious and also timeless subjects such as classics and legends, religious subjects and auspicious images, the kinds one learns at the Kano school. The other pictorial mode is called kyoga, comic or parodic pictures, which were sometimes satirical. Kyoga can be paintings or prints. Stylistically, kyoga was traditionally associated with abbreviated and fluid lines to evoke a light and playful impression. Traditionally, these two modes were separate and the serious honga had a higher status than the humorous kyoga. And what Kyosai did as he searched for his own style was to combine the two traditions of honga and kyoga. He brought humorous elements or contemporary references even into highly detailed, fully finished paintings. By doing so, he overcame the conventions and the categorical device which reflected the social hierarchy in the world of art. So Kyosai's specialism, if you will, was the inclusion of kyoga or comic pictures in his art. I appreciate it's a challenge to share this through a podcast, but could you describe the kind of humor that will be found in Kyosai's works? Sure. There are different types of kyoga, but Kyosai seems to have particularly favored two kinds of humor. One is inversion and the other is poking fun. Inversion is a way to reinterpret a classical or traditional subject and humor is achieved by inverting traditional roles and hierarchies. By that I mean, for example, those who are supposed to be strong suddenly looking pitiful, severe persons behaving comically, holy saints giving in to the profane, or elegant nobles acting just the same as commoners. Examples I really like are images of Shoki, the Chinese folk deity known as the demon queller. If you will excuse my pronunciation, the Chinese name is Chong Kui. He is a protector who vanquishes demons and illness, and the traditional depiction of Shoki is strong and fierce, with his angry face and a sword in his hand, always in pursuit of demons to punish. Kyosai painted many traditional Shoki images, but he also depicted this angry deity as a bullying tyrant who constantly harassed poor demons, even when they were just carrying on their everyday life. Oli, we have links to the images on your podcast page, don't we? Yes, we do. Yeah. Great. Thank you. There is a painting at the Tokyo National Museum in which demons are playing a game of Go while smoking pipes. They are unaware of the approaching Shoki who is hiding behind a rock with his sword ready to jump on them. Another work in the Tabashi Art Museum shows Shoki riding a tiger and chasing after demons who are running, running for their life. Some are falling off from the bridge into the river and one of the demons is carrying a baby on their back who is upside down, obviously in shock and horror. Kyosai is clearly siding with demons who have to put up with this oppressor who police them around and destroys their peace. These paintings are done in powerful brushstrokes in the Kano school style using beautiful colors and one of them even has gold. So here we see the marriage of Honga and Kyoga in these works. Also, these images must reflect Kyosai's view towards authorities, both of the Tokugawa period and the new Meiji era. I think it's important that Kyoga allowed expressions of Kyosai's own emotions and ideas more freely in his works. 
Poking fun was another thing Kyosai did in his pictures. We find many satirical and comic pictures about contemporary society among Kyosai's works, and often animals play the protagonists in these images. One combination of animals we see frequently is cats and catfish. Cats represent geisha or courtesans because their signature music instrument, shamisen, uses cat skin. Catfish stands for the Meiji government officials who had mustaches like catfish whiskers. This analogy also refers to a common belief in Japan that a giant catfish causes earthquakes, implying that these officials were destabilizing the country. Cats and catfish images satirize their relationship because these officials frequented uh, restaurants and pleasure quarters for backroom political dealings over drinks accompanied by geisha. And cats are often in control of catfish in these pictures. In the Israel Goldman collection, there is a painting with a drunk catfish sleeping in futon and a glaring of cats sneaking up to him with giant tweezers to pluck off his mustache, his pride. Cats really look like they're having so much fun, laughing and grinning, and I really love this painting. It relates to the Kyogen play Higeyagura. Kyogen is the medieval tradition of comic theater. This painting will be in the um, upcoming exhibition at the Royal Academy, which I will mention again later. Great. So why do you believe this aspect of his art or art in general, this humorous aspect needs highlighting? Yes, um, it's because Kyosai's engagement with Kyoga made him the artist that he was. That's what makes him special. The encounter with Kyoga opened up new creative possibilities for Kyosai far beyond the Kano tradition. But when I did my PhD research, the impact of Kyoga in the development of Kyosai's art had not been fully explored in the study of this artist. This was due to a more general neglect of the importance of Kyoga. There has been a tendency in the study of Kyosai in Japan to dismiss Kyoga as secondary and not serious enough or worthy of inquiry. In fact, Kyosai's engagement with Kyoga was very much criti criticized by authorities in the art world of his own time and it continued to have a negative impact on his reputation after he died in 1889. In many people's eyes, Kyosai's works did not seem to match the idea of art prevalent in modern Japan, that art should be sophisticated, refined, and spiritual. His art was considered not serious enough and appealing to popular taste, and was criticized for being vulgar and for lacking in philosophy or high ideals. After World War II, until the 1980s, Kyosai was almost forgotten in the history of Japanese art. Despite the recent popularity and recognition of the artist in Japan, his Kyoga is still not receiving much scholarly attention. In order to restore Kyosai's reputation, the tendency in Japan is to emphasize his artistic affiliation with the Kano school and to present him as a serious painter and to overshadow his activities around Kyoga. Problems here are that first, this trend is only going with the academicism, the underlying problematic values within the discipline of art history in Japan, which denied Kyosai's art in the first place. And second, Kyosai's Kyoga works and their importance in his art remain unexplored scholarly. I believe that through Kyoga, Kyosai was able to make his art accessible on the mundane everyday level of people's lives connecting it with his times and with people's feelings. And these familiar realities and everyday sentiments which Kyosai brought into his highly accomplished art are precisely why his works still capture our imagination today. 
And so this attitude within Japan at the time that his Honga was more valuable than his Kyoga paintings, was this reflected in Western collectives of Kyosai's work too? I think that in Europe or in the US, this idea that Honga is better than Kyoga, I don't think it really is strong. It's mostly in Japan. And people do collect both in Japan too. But uh, when it comes to um, scholarly investigation into Kyosai's works, I think oftentimes people put more importance on Honga and not Kyoga. I see. So having had the pleasure of going through Kyosai's more light-hearted works, there's something about them which makes me think of memes today. They're full of pop culture references of the time, using deities and legendary figures of the time to tell a joke that most could relate to. Could you expand on this mixture of traditional figures and comedy? Uh, were there any who might have been offended by humorous portrayals of the Buddha, for example? Uh, yes, indeed, these deities and legendary figures were part of the popular culture of the time. The pictorial device of inversion, which I just mentioned, requires shared knowledge of what these characters represent and what they are supposed to be like. So Kyosai used Shoki, seven lucky gods, Buddhist deities such as Daruma, Emma, the king of hell, wind god, and thunder god, and popular literary figure uh, characters like Asahina, etc. This was nothing unique to Kyosai, of course, and many artists before him and after him parodied these familiar figures in their works. They were sort of common pictorial tropes used in comic pictures, literature, and theater plays. So no, I don't think anyone would have been offended thinking that these were actual attacks on the divinity of these de deities. Even Kano artists had a small repertoire of comic depictions of Buddhist deities and monks. Kyosai actually owned two hand scrolls of Kyoga by Kano Tanyu, an important 17th century Kano painter. These hand scrolls have comic depictions of deities such as Shaka and Amida fishing with monks, and a sumo wrestling bout between Jizo Bosatsu and a Neo Guardian. Humor in these Kano school comic picture is mild, and most importantly, it lacks satirical intent. And the biggest difference between these and Kyosai's is that the Kano masters Kyoga are of a timeless nature and do not reflect contemporary society, unlike Kyosai's Kyoga. Definitely. So we know that Kyosai's Kyoga also hit this social commentary, often mocking court nobles and samurai, as we mentioned earlier. Did this have any repercussions for him at the time? So comic depictions of court nobles and samurai, their generalized images, not of anyone specific, were abandoned in the Edo period or Tokugawa period. So unless it was an attack on a specific person or referencing a specific event, I don't think it would have been problematic. But Kyosai did get into serious trouble in the first years of the Meiji era for allegedly insulting a distinguished person with his painting. This incident happened in 1870 at a painting and calligraphy party called Shogakai. Uh, it's a commercially organized event to which painters and calligraphers were invited and produced works on the spot. Kyosai was really, really drunk, as he sometimes were in these parties, and he was painting Kyoga to make people laugh, and suddenly he found himself arrested on the spot and imprisoned for something he painted. He was accused of making a picture which offended an important person. We don't know of any official record of the trial or the sentence and the artist was too drunk to remember details of the evening. One of the earlier accounts of the incident published in 1882 says that the painting showed a person in court attire being penetrated sexually by a foreigner. Charming. 
this rumor persisted, but whether the image was of a sexual nature or not, the picture in question seems to have implied that foreigners were taking advantage of the Japanese government. While being imprisoned, Kyosai got sick because of the highly unsanitary condition in the lockup, and it was just an awful experience for him. He regretted drinking too much and crossing the line. Kyosai was not a political activist, and I don't think he ever thought about agitating the crowd with his kyoga. He only intended to make people laugh and let off steam, so to say. This incident did not make him popular with the authorities, but the notoriety appealed to the public and his name became even more commercially attractive. So he did gain something even from such a terrible event. I see. So uh, as we've just covered there, uh, Kyosai's sense of humor certainly wasn't always family friendly with many of his kyoga falling under the category of shunga or erotica, something you've written about in your 2017 book, Sex and Laughter with Kyosai. How were these works received by the Japanese public of the time and how have they been viewed by international art collectors since? Ideas about Shunga in Kyosai's time would have been quite different. Um, these sex images were definitely not perceived as scandalous or anything like that. In his time, Shunga were more commonly known as makurae, pillow pictures, or waraie, pictures for laughter. Although what I hear did not always mean laughter and it sometimes just indicated that it had something to do with sex. But humor was always an important part of this tradition, and there is no better word to, ex to describe Kyosai's shunga than pictures to laugh at. Shunga were considered auspicious and sometimes believed to work as talisman. It's because happy sex represented a happy family and meant prosperity of the family. And also, as the saying goes, laughter brings happiness. So they were often specially made as New Year's celebratory gifts. There are scholars who do not think exhibiting shunga in a public space like in a museum is appropriate because these images were enjoyed privately. There are types of shunga like that, I'm sure, but Kyosai's shunga were enjoyed more openly with multiple people laughing together. Kyosai even painted them impromptu in front of an audience. Ideas around Shunga really changed in Japan in the modern period under the Western influence, and they started to be regarded as obscene and something to be hidden. There are records by American and Russian officials and business people visiting Japan who were very shocked to be presented with these images as a special treat or gifts. <laughs> but at the same time, in Europe, there were enthusiastic collectors of Japanese art who embraced the beauty of their production because many of them are indeed gorgeous and exquisite, high quality pieces of artwork. What is funny is that today outside Japan, well, I guess not so much in the US, but certainly in Europe, the attitude towards Shunga is much more open. But in Japan, there is still a persistent stigma against Shunga. The world's top Kyosai collector, Israel Goldman, who we call Izzy, has collected Kyosai's Shunga as a part of his comprehensive collection of this artist's works. He discovered many of them because no one else was actively collecting them. And it's a great contribution to the study of Kyosai and to our understanding of his work. Thank you. So for listeners keen to find out more about Kyosai, they have a wonderful exhibition created by you at the Royal Academy of Arts to look forward to, uh, which is opening in March, as well as two publications coming out soon. Do you hope to challenge people's preconceptions of what art ought to be valued through this exhibition of Kyosai's works, including many of his kyoga? The exhibition Kyosai, the Israel Goldman Collection at the Royal Academy of Arts will open to the public on the 19th of March. 
the Goldman Collection is one of the largest and richest collection of the artist's works in the world. I think people today are much more open-minded and are more used to diverse artistic expressions. But yes, I do hope visitors will embrace the variety and enjoy discovering different values in them. The exhibition demonstrates Kyosai's vast range from highly finished detailed paintings to spontaneous freewheeling works and from serious religious images to funny, outrageous pictures. The fact that they are all Kyosai from one artist is quite illuminating, I think. What I have been trying is not to single out one aspect of Kyosai's work or to overemphasize it. I understand that it is tempting to present Kyosai as a brilliant sat satirist, and that's definitely a part of him. But the idea of satirical artist often comes with its own set of preconceptions. With historical art, the traditional concept of hierarchy is still persistent, and it's easy not to expect a satirist to be a highly accomplished top-tier artist, for example, unless you're talking about someone like Francisco Goya. In Goya's case, his satirical images are also very dark and grim, and it's hard not to take him seriously, I suppose. Humor and playfulness are always at a risk of being treated lightly and laughed off, but I would like the visitors to see in Kyosai's works what the tradition of comic pictures brought to his art and how it enriched it. But of course, you don't need to make a serious face when looking at his humorous works. That's not what I mean. I want everyone to have fun, laugh, smile, or not, if they're not really your cup of tea. But yes, embrace the whole Kyosai experience and enjoy. Definitely. And I have to say that I think even looking at some of his more graphic paintings, you can't help but admire the skill that has gone into creating them. Yes. Well, thank you for answering my questions, Koto. Uh, before we finish the episode, could you share with us what other projects you're currently working on? So now that the exhibition is about to start and the exhibition catalogue and the small book on Kyosai's animal images titled Kyosai's Animal Circus will be published soon to accompany the exhibition, I will go back to my PhD dissertation and turn that into a book manuscript. The original title of the dissertation, if translated in English, is Kawanabe Kyosai and Kyoga, exploring a new era through comic pictures. And um, it discusses some of the topics we have talked about today. It will be published in Japan and Japanese, but I'm hoping to write and publish more in English in the future. Great. And uh, do you have any inkling as to what might lie beyond Kyosai for you, or is he going to occupy your time for the foreseeable future? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think so. I, I do actually have uh, more projects uh, around Kyosai. Um, I am keen to work on something other than Kyosai too, but for the time, in, uh, for the time being, um, I'm very much occupied with this artist. Great. Well, thank you for joining me today, Koto. It's been a real pleasure. The pleasure was mine. Thank you, Oli. You can find the link to Koto's research profile in the description below. Don't forget to subscribe on japaninnorwich.org or on your preferred podcast provider for updates on new episodes. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Andreas Musolf, professor at the School of Politics, Philosophy, Language and Communication Studies at the University of East Anglia, to discuss the body politic and how metaphors for nations vary across the world. We hope you'll join us then. Thank you for listening.